maybe we should get started because I do have a bit of a long presentation. <coughs> dealing with a big topic. Um, anyway, uh, I want to acknowledge the Saguin Ojibwe Nation um, and the organizers for inviting me here. Um, this is the first free prior informed consent conference that I've seen. Uh, I don't I haven't seen anybody else deal with this topic, even though to me it's, a, it's an urgent topic. Um, even the Assembly of First Nations only choose at breakout sessions. You know, they don't really, they haven't devoted a conference on it. Although they did devote a conference on pipelines and energy, but not on that pick. And I'll be overlapping a little bit with what uh, Hayden King uh, talked about, but I have a different take on a lot of this uh, than Hayden. Uh, Um, anyway, so my topic is on countering the Trudeau government's plan to domesticate the UN Declaration, Free Prior Informed Consent, and the Hijack Indigenous Self Determination. Uh, it's a long title, but that's what I believe actually is happening. Um, even Hayden, I think, mentioned that they were domesticating the UN Declaration. Um, but it is a pretty elaborate, uh, pretty elaborate scheme that uh, the Trudeau government is going through. So. I may as well just get right into it. And people are always teasing me, say, Russ, you don't start with Christopher Columbus, do you? <laughs> but I say, no, Jacques Cartier. <laughs> anyway, um, so the parts of my presentation is I want to give some historical context to colonization. And then I want to talk about the liberals' platform promises, because this is their promises to decolonize and to reconcile and all of that. And then I want to talk about what they've done since they formed office, and then get into this recognition uh, framework that they uh, they have been talking about. Um, I have here on impacts on land terms policy because I used that uh, in a previous session, but it really affects self-government and everything. And then I added a section on for this uh, some slides to talk about the development of indigenous self-determination plans because I know that this that was the purpose of this. Uh, conference was to talk about um, how to to um, implement free prior informed consent in consultation or in in development processes um, rather than the duty to consult which is what the domestic uh, standard is that Canada is using and then I have a, a couple of quick conclusions I could be your clicker if you want just tell me why well okay. Everybody okay. Wants to do that All right. <laughs> so, anyways, I do go back to Jacques Cartier. I mean, this is when things started to change for us in in uh, Kerr Island. Is um, up the St. Lawrence River. You know, uh, we had Jacques Cartier, and then later on Samuel de Champlain, and then John Cabot in what they call Newfoundland. And um, in Quebec, of course, um, under the Quebec uh, French Civil Code. They only recognized, well, they didn't recognize indigenous peoples because they were savages. So they considered them like animals and not capable of having laws, but they still entered into agreements um, with First Nations, even though they considered them subordinate. Um, and of course, the British had the planting of the flag, the doctrine of discovery. That was the basis that they, uh, they used to, uh, to claim dominion over newfound lands. So of course, right from the beginning, before contact with Europeans, we made uh, treaties, agreements between ourselves as indigenous nations. And we did that through Wampum, uh, in what, uh, what uh, anthropologists call the Northeastern Woodlands, um, right from the coast, you know, of um, um, the Atlantic region, the Maritimes region, down into Maine. And um, of course, between the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee nations. And um, these are just some examples of some of the belts. Um, the early treaties, well, of course, everyone talks about the two world wampum, Kuswinta, and um, the, there were other wampums that were made after that, and there were treaties. Uh, there was a Seven Nations Confederacy. I'm from Ganawage, uh, Mohawk Nation of Ganawage, and our uh, community was part of the Seven Nations Confederacy, which is different than the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. 
we were the French allies uh, that surrounded around Montreal. And um, in 1760, when the British came, they wanted to meet with us and ask us to remain neutral when they wanted to march on Montreal to defeat the French. And so there was um, a treaty meeting held around where Cornwall is today. A treaty was called uh, in, in the spring of 1760. And we agreed to remain neutral. They did uh, conquer the French. And in the fall of 1760, there was a treaty of Ganawagi made with the Seven Nations Confederacy. And it was basically to form a military and trade alliance. And basically joining under the same agreement that the Haudenosaunee Confederacy already had with the British. So we agreed to be British allies. And then, of course, um, Pontiac didn't trust the British, burned down 10 of the 12 forts in the Great Lakes. And a lot of that contributed to the unrest, contributed to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, where the Crown King George III promised there would be no trespassing on Indian lands without Indian consent. And nobody could purchase land from the Indians except the Crown. And um, that, of course, was all um, those previous treaties of peace and friendship were all culminated in the Treaty of Niagara in 1764, which is this bill here. And uh, that was the basis of the relationship between the British and the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations who were uh, part of the <coughs> Treaty of Niagara. And um, that was the basis in which we became allies to fight in the War of 1812. Um, and it was many, uh, many indigenous uh, men who died on the front lines in that war. Um, many Mohawks, but not just Mohawks, there were Anishinaabe uh, leaders as well, and uh, fighters, warriors. And um, so this was kind of the turning point, 1812, of working together. <coughs> Next slide, please. Although there were, um, I don't know why that's not coming up, but there were treaties made um, across the prairies and, of course, here in Ontario. These are pre-confederation treaties in um, the Atlantic. Those are peace and friendship treaties. They don't have the treaties from what's, what was called Lower Canada and Upper Canada, the ones I was talking about in 1760. They're not on this map. Canada hasn't mapped them, mostly because the nations haven't brought them out yet to talk about them. There's not many people know about that part of the history of Canada. So the treaty making occurred, and um, the last treaty, of course, was the, was the Williams Treaty, uh, not too far from here, in 1923. Yeah. Um, that was the last historic treaty, and then they started the so-called modern treaties. And of course, in 1867, I would say it's probably about the 1830s and 40s that we became outnumbered. Uh, we, as indigenous peoples, became outnumbered in Upper and Lower Canada. And instead of us being allies uh, in military and trade, they started passing laws over us in about 1850, um, defining Owen Indian as a, the, the pre-confederation versions of the Indian Act started to be passed. Then, of course, the first constitution was the British Constitution, the British North America Act. And um, that's when we were really colonized. And that's really when the racism and genocide uh, and colonization took effect. Um, next slide. So I've just listed some of the main uh, federal powers here, but there's division of powers between Section 91, federal powers, Section 92, provincial. So the federal heads of powers, these are all areas that the federal parliament can pass laws over. And of course, the Indian Act was passed under Section 91.4, Indians and Lands Reserved for Indians. And, um, all, all these other areas, like regulation of trade and commerce, of course, are areas that even today they won't negotiate sharing any of those powers with us as indigenous nations. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, under the provincial powers, the provinces had the jurisdiction over natural resources and the uh, sale of lands, of course, municipalities and all these other areas. These are just some examples. And um, that's where a lot of the conflicts happened because you went off reserve 
And the early court cases in the 1960s were all hunting and fishing, where Indians were charged with hunting or fishing on um, violating provincial regulations. So if you look at those early case law, that's what it started with before we started talking about the Constitution. It started out very basic. And uh, it was because we were kind of meeting the sandwich between the two areas of jurisdiction because our jurisdiction wasn't recognized in this, new con this first Constitution. Next time. And of course, in 1876, the Indian Act was passed. That's still in place today. They've amended it from time to time. But, you know, it was in 1927, I believe, they, um, they amended it um, to make it illegal to hold meetings and ceremonies. And that's when a lot of our, um, our people had to do things underground from the Indian agents. And that's when they confiscated a lot of our material culture, our wampum belts out in the you see, you know, their masks, anything to do with our governance systems, because our ceremonies were tied to our governance systems, and that's what they wanted to, to kill. So when the Indian Act was passed, that was the main instrument to control and manage us. It still is today, um, but in different ways. But they've amended it from time to time. Those amendments that they had from 1927 lasted until 1951, when they relaxed uh, those provisions. Uh, next slide. And of course, there was the pass system. They didn't use that on us here in the East. They mostly used it in uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta. But basically, um, you know, after the um, rebellion with Rael, Gloria Rael and uh, Métis and, and the Indians that were involved in that, they imposed the pass system. And although they knew it wasn't legal, the Sir John A. Macdonald, the Prime Minister, first Prime Minister, got uh, the RCMP to agree to impose it anyway. So that without this piece of paper in those two provinces mainly, if you were caught off reserve, you'd go to jail. And the Indian agent had to sign it and say what purpose. There'd be a date when you, it would last for. So it was a temporary pass because you had to go back. And they used this to stop parents from going to see their kids at residential schools too because they wanted to keep that separation. So this was something that a lot of Canadians don't know existed, but a guy named Alex Williams did a documentary about it called The Pass System. If you haven't seen it, you should look at it. Because he actually found a few of the remaining passes that are left because they put out an order to destroy all of them, to destroy the evidence. But he found some of them actually in the Alberta Museum. And that's how he built his documentary on the, the Pass System. And then, of course, 100 years after Confederation, we had a new uh, liberal government come in, headed up by Pierre Trudeau and his Minister of Indian Affairs, Jean Chrétien. And in 1968, they did a, a series of consultations, 50 years ago this year, actually, um, about what, uh, what kind of changes that Indians wanted to see. And um, in 1969, that's when they released this policy where they didn't really listen to the, what they heard in the consultations. They came up with their own ideas. Uh, next slide, please. So their own ideas were basically to eliminate Indian status, to dissolve the uh, Department of Indian Affairs within five years, abolish the Indian Act and remove Section 9124, that's a section in the Constitution that refers to Indians and lands reserved for Indians, convert reserved land to private property so they can be sold by the band or its members, transfer responsibility for Indian affairs uh, from the federal government to the province and integrate those services, the same as other Canadians, provide funding for economic development you know, on an interim basis, and appoint a commissioner to address outstanding land claims and gradually terminate existing treaties, meaning historic treaties. So, you know, I've seen documentation, um, of course, with their, the response to this, was the creation of uh, provincial organizations like the Union of Ontario Indians, uh, Union of BC Indian Chiefs, uh, Union of Nova Scotia Indians. A lot of these organizations were based on the, the labor union model because a lot of the leaders at the time w worked in the trades. So that was the model they knew how to organize. So that's how come you see some of these provincial organizations called the Union. The union. But they advocate for efforts on tree rights. And of course, they created the National Union Brotherhood as the umbrella organization, which is the precursor to the Assembly of First Nations. 
And um, in 1971, it was Indians of Alberta Association that issued the white red paper in response to the white paper <laughs> led by Harold Carter, uh, who was written some important books that you should be aware of, like The Unjust Society. Um, he wrote that in response to the white paper. And um, I've seen correspondents basically saying that senior management, um, like assistant deputy minister to deputy minister level, and then from Gretchen to Trudeau, basically saying the, the premises, the objectives in the white paper are sound, despite the Indian opposition. Um, we just need to remove the five-year plan. It's going to take a lot longer, like about 50 years, <laughs> and, um, and put it into components. So I'd argue you could see each of these components being acted on by the government. So rather than it being a package deal, they broke it off into pieces, and they've been working on the pieces separately since then. And I can uh, show you current initiatives that all fit to each one of these points. I'll kind of get into that. Next slide. So of course, in the 70s, um, the federal government kept trying to talk to the leaders about, you know, after they rejected the white paper, they said, well, let's amend the Indian Act. That was their big thing on the agenda. So for a decade, it was amend the Indian Act. And the leaders kept saying, no, we want you to recognize our Aboriginal treaty rights. We don't want to talk about the Indian Act. And um, I actually um, was a student at Trent Native Studies with Chris Pheasant uh, in 1980 when I was at the Skyline Hotel in Ottawa where Prime Minister uh, Pierre Trudeau came in and told the uh, chiefs in the National Indian Brotherhood meeting, he says, and I remember this, he said, I want you to treat Canada better than Canada's treated you. And that's where he announced he was going to patriate the Constitution from England back to Canada. And that kicked off the process to do it. And of course, during the negotiations between the premiers and the prime minister or the federal government, uh, there was a section recognizing Aboriginal treaty rights that was in, and then they took it out because the premiers of Saskatchewan and Alberta wanted it out. And the, the first section said, uh, we recognize and affirm the Aboriginal treaty rights of Aboriginal peoples. But after Indians with Canadian supporters agitated to get it put back in, including the Constitution Express, a train from Vancouver to Ottawa, a lot of pressure, they put it back in and became Section 35 of the Constitution. But they added a word. They said, we hereby recognize and affirm the existing Aboriginal treaty rights of Aboriginal peoples. And they did that to limit future interpretation of that clause. And that's been confirmed by the Supreme Court saying uh, since then that, the, that the Section 35 means those rights that existed as of April 17, 1982, when the Queen signed it into law uh, on Parliament Hill. That's what the picture is of. Anyway, um, so that, we had constitutional talks in the 80s, and actually Section 35 was supposed to be a political agreement. There was a Section 37 in that new constitution that said the Prime Minister had to call a First Minister's Conference within one year of this becoming law in order to define what Aboriginal treaty rights are. And there were four national Aboriginal organizations represented in those talks. So in 1983, they met. And uh, they amended the Constitution, Section 35, um, because comprehensive claims agreements, um, it wasn't clear whether those were included in the meaning of treaties or not, you know, recognizing Aboriginal treaty rights. So they amended uh, the Constitution to add Section 35.3, which says any land claims agreements that have been made or will be made are for greater certainty are treaties and the meaning of 35.1. And it was the James Bay Cree that wanted their, the James Bay Agreement included in, and others who were negotiating wanted that included, because there were six groups negotiating conference of claims at the time. So they included that in the amendment to the Constitution. And then the issue about um, gender equality had come up in that 1983 conference, you know, the discrimination in the Indian Act and that. Um, so they added Section 35.4 that said all laws are guaranteed equally to men and women. And then, because the <coughs> Constitution said there was only one meeting required, you know, to define Aboriginal treaty rights, Section 35, they added on um, three more meetings in a schedule. And um, 
So then that was there was one in 84, 85, and the last one was in 87. And uh, basically the governments ran out the clock, kind of like what Elijah Harper did on Leech Lake. Um, you know, there was a deadline and they ran it out so until the deadline came. And so what they did was they focused on self-government. Is self-government uh, an inherent right? Or is it, is it a contingent or conditional right depending on reaching agreements with crown governments, like federal provincial governments? And the governments kept proposing an amendment to the Constitution that would put a process in place to negotiate. And you know, if you've got agreements, then you have recognized self-government. The four national organizations rejected that proposal at all three meetings. So those talks ended in failure. There was no political agreement on the meaning of Aboriginal treaty rights or self-government. So, um, um, next slide, please. These people took over. And in 1990, they started to interpret Section 35. This is the current bench right now. But I think it was Chief Brian Dixon that was there in 1990 that handed down the Sparrow decision. So since then, for the last 30-some years, they've been handing down uh, court decisions, uh, giving out legal tests and standards which costs millions and millions of dollars to meet. You know, if you assert, the burden of proof is on the Aboriginal group who's asserting they have an Aboriginal treaty right. So you have to come up with the historical and cultural evidence to meet the legal tests. Like in Sparrow, uh, they said Section 35, uh, Aboriginal rights are not absolute, they can be justified being infringed. And um, that's part of the principles of Section 35. Um, that's why even if you're asserting you have Aboriginal title, like Slave II for them in the Trans Mountain corridor area, um, a pipeline can be considered in the national interest and they can override the Aboriginal title of the groups in that corridor. That's what we're seeing happening now with the, what the Prime Minister's doing. And it's all based on this interpretation of Section 35 that started in 1990 and has continued to now, including the Mikasu case, just uh, uh, a couple weeks ago where they said that the Crown doesn't have to consult on legislation. But that's a series of decisions which sets out what's called an Aboriginal law framework that now exists because of all this case law for Aboriginal rights and treaty rights. And like I said, if you're going to assert you have rights, the burden's on you to prove it. So you have to come up with the money to collect the research and to sustain constitutional challenges in court. Most bands in the country can't afford to do that. The government knows that, so they've come up with their own negotiation policies. So you don't have to take us to court, we'll negotiate. Then they put preconditions on their negotiations. And if you don't like it, you wind up in court anyway. <laughs> um, so in 2007, on top of the domestic constitutional situation that's evolved in Canada, the United Nations uh, General Assembly adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, next slide. Can't take notes and do that at the same time. So these are some of the selected articles of the UN Declaration that I that I highlighted here. Um, I should have put in Article 18 because Article 18 says that uh, Indigenous peoples have the right to make decisions through their own Indigenous institutions. And uh, as I pointed out to a number of chiefs, um, it's just not up to the governments to respect and implement the UN Declaration is up to our leadership to do it to our organizations. Because bands and band councils are not indigenous institutions. Um, yet that's where most, that's who's selecting leaders who are in here and this, what's not added in this is saying that the state will negotiate with indigenous representatives before any legislative or administrative measures. So you can see why this is problematic when I get into some further slides. But the people are being left behind. That's Article 18. Because the people have a right to, you know, <clears throat> to be part of the decision-making process. And the Indian Act doesn't really allow for that. And the right to self-determination, of course, that's the right of the people. Anyways, so these are some of the main ones. Today. 26, 27, and 28 are key articles of the UN Declaration. And I haven't heard the federal government or Prime Minister Justin Trudeau mention lands once. But Article 26 is about restoration of lands, territories, and resources. 
27, a fair process to jointly develop to adjudicate those land rights. We've never had a say in any land claims policies. It was in 1973 that the land claims policies were developed by Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Jean Chrétien. And in fact, Justin Trudeau is implementing his father's land claims policies today because they're basically the same. They haven't changed. And um, so a fair process would mean jointly developed, and we have never jointly developed those land claims policies or processes. So if Trudeau was honest, which I don't believe he is, he would have put a process in place that would have to involve provinces because they're the ones that have taken our lands, territories, and resources under that first constitution in 1867. And so 28 says if you're not going to restore the lands, you at least have to give restitution, you know, for lands that you've taken without compensation. We aren't talking about any of this. And how are you going to, to, to have any kind of economic viability or self-determination in the future if you don't have a sufficient land base? As my friend Art Manuel always used to say, uh, all the existing reserves in Canada add up to 0.2% of the country, and the provinces and the feds control the rest of the land. That's why we're poor. And he's right, there's a lot of truth to that. It's a structural, systemic problem. And unless we change the system and the structure, it's not going to change. Anyways, free prior informed consent is embedded in all that, but that's tied to the greater self-determination. So when the Liberals uh, were running in the 2015 election, they made promises on Indigenous issues to help fix this colonial history that we have to so-called decolonize. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the key promises, I just want to review them in case you've forgotten or didn't know they made them. <laughs> <laughs> Is they promised to immediately re-engage in a renewed nation-to-nation -nation, uh, process with Indigenous peoples. Uh, develop in full partnership with First Nations a federal reconciliation framework. And the framework was to include mechanisms to advance and strengthen self-government, address outstanding land claims, and resolve grievances of both existing historical treaties and modern land claims agreements. Then, of course, to enact the 94 cause to action of the TRC and adopt the UN Declaration. <coughs> they also promised to recognize and respect Aboriginal title and rights. Again, putting provisos saying in accordance with Canada's constitution and, um, and also within the UN Declaration, um, which of course is subject to their interpretation, so that's the proviso. They promised to lift the 2% cap on funding that um, a Liberal government put in place. It was Jean Chrétien's government in 1995 that put that 2% cap on the First Nations funding in place, and it was Paul Martin, as finance minister, uh, who did it. And that 2% cap arguably is still in place, despite the new money that they promised, <clears throat> because it imposed a structural cap. Then, of course, uh, they promised to endorse the uh, Eford Report, and Douglas Eford was a lawyer in Vancouver who reviewed the comprehensive claims policy and made recommendations. Um, basically to tweak it a little bit. But he didn't even mention the Chilcote decision, you know, which recognized uh, that the Chilcote had Aboriginal title as part of the territory. So that wasn't even in his report. That was under Harper. Anyway, next, next slide, please. Now this is a big one. They, they promised to undertake a full review of law and policies and practices in full partnership and consultation with First Nations and to make sure it was executing its consultation, accommodation, and consent, consent obligations, including on resource development and energy infrastructure project reviews and assessments. To me, that would include pipelines. In accordance with our constitutional and international human rights obligations. So that's always the proviso, it's how they interpret that, right? How they interpret Section 35 and how they interpret the UN Declaration and other international human rights instruments. I'm sure Paul Joff and uh, Jennifer are talking about that right now. So what have they done since they got in uh, to fulfill these promises? Um, one of the first things that Trudeau did is he started talking to The Economist magazine about, um, you know, us being a fourth level government in Canada. He was asked about the uh, deregulation on interprovincial trade within Canada 
and this is he said uh, the way to get it done is not to sit there and impose the way to have that done is to actually have a good working relationship with the premiers with municipal governments and with indigenous leadership because indigenous governments are the fourth level of government in this country now nobody's questioned him about this none of the mainstream media or even aboriginal media as far as i know but when i saw it because it's on a videotape uh, I was shocked because obviously I don't believe he invented that. I think he was probably briefed as a new prime minister about this plan that they have and where things are going to fit. But some media should question him about what he meant by that. Mm -hmm. But that was in 2016. Uh, next slide, please. So by December 2016, he announced he was going to have a two track reconciliation approach, one to kind of deal with immediate issues and one to deal with longer term issues. And in a way, this was kind of the first signal that he was going to split the dissolve Indian Affairs and create two new departments, although he didn't announce it at the time. But he did announce that he was going to work with the three national indigenous leaders and organizations. So basically, this top down approach using the national organizations. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So basically, under the two-track plan, the way I viewed it right away was that he was talking about 9124, so that's the on-reserve status Indian issues like housing, health, you know, water, you know, getting clean drinking water, all that. I saw he was addressing that. And also Section 35 is the longer-term issues about land claims agreements, self-government agreements, the longer-term relationship issues. Uh, next slide, please. So the first agreement that they set out was with AFN on the, to remove that 2% cap and come up with a new fiscal relationship is they signed a SMOU with AFN to set up a fiscal relations table in 2016. Next slide, please. In December of 2017, they came up with a report. And in that, it was a joint report from AFN in Canada. And in that report, they said basically, there's other ways to get money other than transfer payments from the government. They're saying you can increase your economic development by growing First Nations businesses on reserve mainly, I believe. Resolving comprehensive and specific land claims and additions to reserve, because they're looking at uh, additional lands as maybe being a base. In a way, it's acknowledging the existing reserve land base for many bands is not economically viable. So that's why the additions to reserve policy has changed to gain additional lands. But often they won't do that unless there's a legal obligation to do it. Uh, for social, uh, they say they're doing it for social policy reasons now, but uh, from what I understand, they're making it very difficult to do that. And of course, the specific and comprehensive claims are all based on denial and extinguishment of rights. But and you get a you know cash settlement at the end as part of the extinguishing. <clears throat> so they're saying that's the money's out of that is a way for you to create revenue to manage it to the future. And of course, resource revenue sharing, and that only involves having agreements with the provinces because they control the lands, territories, and resources off reserve. So that won't happen without provincial agreements. And then increasing other forms of revenue sharing, such as gaming. And I think it was a Shwanaga that went to, I think the Supreme Court, and lost, and court said that gaming is a provincial jurisdiction and that led basically to First Nations province by province having to enter an agreement with the province. Ontario was the first with RAMA, but since then other First Nations and other provinces have worked out funding arrangements like Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, I think uh, Nova Scotia. BC is just now starting to talk about it. And then of course taxation. They always want to get rid of that uh, tax exemption. So that's, uh, that's on the table here in this uh, new fiscal relationship report. Next slide, please. So in 2017, June of 2017, uh, Canada and AFN signed a, an agreement on shared priorities. And there were eight, but I focused on just a few main ones. Next slide, please. So these are the main ones I thought were important when I saw them. One is for AFN to work in partnership with Canada on measures to implement the UN Declaration, including co-development of a national action plan, 
which, you know, in discussion of proposals for a federal legislative framework on implementation, so that seems to be this recognition framework. To work uh, jointly to decolonize and align federal laws and policies with the UN Declaration. And, um, of course, to close the gap, as the National Chief always likes to say, on the social economic gap. Um, so for AFN to say they haven't been involved in developing the um, the uh, recognition framework that's currently underway, I'd say that's disingenuous because their budget's increased based on this MOU. That's their job. And again, it's this top-down approach, uh, which is bypassed uh, our people. Next slide, please. So this is where I want to start to hone in on what, what they've been doing. <clears throat> right from the beginning, <coughs> They said they were going to do a Canadian definition of the UN Declaration. Jim Carr told the Standing Committee in April of 2016 that the government's in the process of providing a Canadian definition to the Declaration. Uh, government's currently in the process of providing greater clarity to these definitions, and we're going to get there by following a process and a regulatory regime. So he said that right from the beginning after they were elected. And then Carolyn Bennett, a month later, in the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues at May, said we intend nothing less than to adopt and implement the Declaration. And then she said in accordance with the Canadian Constitution. So right there, they qualified their adoption of it because they're saying the Constitution Act 1867 and their interpretation of Section 35 are included in how they're going to interpret the UN Declaration. And she also said that Canada believes that constitutional obligations, including free prior informed consent, are in modern treaties and self-government agreements. Um, the problem with that statement, I think, is that, like, as I said, we had no say in the land times policies right from 1973. Groups settled under it, but they had to accept the preconditions to the negotiations. Same with the self-government policy of 1995, the so-called inherent right policy. There's preconditions to negotiating that to basically convert PANs into municipal type governments. So yes, there's a number of groups that have signed modern treaties and self-government agreements under those policies, but to say that represents free prior informed consent, I think it's a stretch. To me, it's more coerced than consent. Um, especially many that are still at negotiating tables and don't want to settle under the existing policy because they feel that it's an unfair process. And of course, when they do these agreements, the yes side is always funded and has lawyers and advisors. The no side gets nothing because they want a yes out of our people. So if anybody raises concerns and say, wait a minute, there's a con. It's not just a pro side. There's a con to this, too. They, they don't get the support because the government doesn't want to hear that. They just want to fulfill their agreements, the terms. So Jody wilson Raybould at the same meeting told the UN Declaration there's a need for a national action plan, what their government's been referring to as a reconciliation framework. Don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are modern treaties and self-government agreements, uh, both comprehensive and sectoral. And then she also said there are regional and national indigenous institutions that support nation rebuilding, for example, in land management and financial administration. Now, first of all, I'd argue these are not indigenous institutions. They were set up under federal legislation. They might have indigenous people sitting on the boards, but it was set up by Ottawa to fulfill Ottawa's objectives. And so land management financial institutions, go to the next slide, please. There's a lot of stuff in here. You won't be able to read it, but I threw it in to, to highlight my tangent on this, which is that um, in order to get out of the Indian Act, they've developed all these other regimes. And really, it's to turn the reserve lands over from being federal Section 9124 lands held communally by our communities into being private ownership under Section 92. And you can see here, uh, First Nations uh, Property Ownership Initiative. This is something they want to bring in where they want the residential lands to be private property although they're going to be, remain as reserve lands for now, but they want to get people into it. First Nations Land Management Act, many bands have gone into this in order to develop land codes. Uh, Nishka, this is a modern treaty 
Seashell, they were the first self-government uh, agreement in Canada in 1985. And Tawasin is a modern treaty out in BC. So are they, um, are they still Section 91 24 lands? Yes, yes, no, yes, no. So under the modern treaties, you can see, you know, you basically give up your reserves and get private property. That's uh, what the outcome is. And then for Seashell, it says uh, yes, but if they sell the land, then it becomes Section 92 lands or provincial lands. So I would say this chart, which is an internal government chart, shows where their objectives are. Same with Section 87, the Indian Act exemption. Yes, yes, no, yes, no. So modern treaties, you can see again, they want to get rid of that tax exemption. So these are the national institutions that are involved on the new fiscal policy that Jody Wilson Rainbow referred to at the UN. So I just wanted to show you the different types of land regimes that are being set up under legislation and agreements out of the Indian Act. But the federal government has a, a national plan and goals that they want. Next slide, please. And this is just a summary of changes between the First Nations uh, property ownership system and the current Indian Act system and the results. Mm -hmm. I don't expect you to read it all, but it just shows that they're heading us down to what the white paper said is to convert reserves into mm -hmm. these simple lands where individuals and bands can sell their lands. But this is this is kind of the last uh, step towards that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so going back to the Canadian definition, Jody Wilson Rebel told AFN in 2016 adopting the UN Declaration is unworkable, and ultimately it's going to be articulated through constitutional framework of Section 35, because they're, they're controlling the interpretation of Aboriginal treaty rights, their case law that's already existed, and their policies. Next slide, please. So the Trudeau government says there's three federal paths to reconciliation. They've created these new tables. There's about 70 of them. Um, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit tables, mostly First Nations. Um, and then they have these existing tables, which I've always called the termination tables. A lot of the communities negotiating out of them don't like that, but in my view, that's, that's what's happening at the end result of these, is you're negotiating modern treaties and soft government through policies which are one-sided and unfair policies. Um, in order for the government to get uh, the objectives that it wants, which is to get out of uh, ongoing rights as much as possible. Then re resolving specific claims, since the Trudeau government came in, they have a joint uh, technical working group they've had with AFN to work on an independent claims process. They don't talk about the policy, just the process, because there's a backlog of hundreds of specific claims. And specific claims are lawful obligations, you know, where if a reserve was promised under a treaty and you didn't get it, then that would be a specific claim. If you had trust funds that they mismanaged, um, you know, Indian Affairs, then that's a specific claim. So that's what they mean by specific claims, is lawful obligations managing Indian lands or Indian monies. So it's a very narrow interpretation. Uh, they do have a policy and a process and a tribunal. But it has a limit of only claims at 150 million or less that are valued. Big claims are still subject to the conflict of interest of the federal cabinet deciding if they're going to settle them or not. So these are the three paths to reconciliation that they've laid out. So these exploratory tables, you know, these recognition tables, uh, Joe Wild, who's a senior assistant deputy minister, um, for the Crown Indigenous Relations now. He said that they're an arena for new interpretation of Section 35. That's the only reason I put that in there is to show um, that they're basically trying to use those tables to help develop a national framework. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This isn't coming up very good, but North of 60, these are the modern uh, treaty agreements in the Northwest Territories. and. Uh, and the Nunavut and the Yukon and the James Bay Agreement. And the only ones south of 60 is Nishka, Tawasin, and there should be another one, Manolf, but they're very tiny on the Vancouver Island. 
So these are all areas that have, you know, basically extinguished tidal under modern trees. Next slide, please. And this is just a map showing you where the um, current negotiations are taking place across Canada for either comprehensive claims or self-government. So you can see they're pretty much spread out all over. And these are funded negotiation processes, but they want them to come to conclusions. <laughs> So as I've said, um, self-determination, I think, is the most important uh, um, part of the uh, UN Declaration, you know, Article 3. And um, it's because, not just because it's in the UN Declaration, but that affirms that the existing UN covenants, you know, on civil and political rights and economic and social and cultural rights apply to indigenous peoples. Like Article 1 of the UN Civil and Political uh, uh, Covenant says all peoples have the right to self-determination. Well, the UN Declaration says indigenous peoples are peoples who have that right to self-determination. It's not the UN Declaration at all. <clears throat> it's these international instruments that we can rely on. That Trudeau is uh, basically hijacking through these processes. Uh, it's the umbrella right in the UN Declaration, and all of these uh, issues related to land rights and free prior informed consent are tied to self-determination. So if you don't have indigenous decision making recognized over lands and resources, um, then they're not serious about implementing the UN Declaration. And I think when Trudeau bought uh, the Kinder Morgan pipeline that showed me, you know, that he didn't care about the free prior informed consent. Because free prior informed consent is a higher standard than the duty to consult. The duty to consult, um, again, the burden of proof is on you to prove that you have a right that you need to be consulted on. And then you also, if you know there's a project or activity in your traditional territory, you have to go through a legal exercise called uh, strength of claim. So you have to prove uh, what your strength of claim is and how the project or activity will affect your, your right that you're asserting. So if you have an Aboriginal title, which is the strongest right you can assert in Canada, um, you know, like for a pipeline, as I said, under their law, it can be justified and infringed. So, a pipeline in the national interest, they can say to you, yeah, you have Aboriginal title, but, you know, this pipeline's important to us, so we're going ahead with it. That's what you're seeing playing out, so. They're not respecting ethic at all, I mean, uh, as far as I can see. They're pushing the duty to consult standard, which is much lower, and most of us can't afford to really exercise it because all of the evidence we have to cut. Cultural evidence, historical evidence, scientific evidence, economic evidence. You have to do mapping, computer mapping. Uh, there's a lot of work. You have to have databases. You have to have expert advisors, interdisciplinary, depending on what the project, if it's mining, hydro, forestry, you name it. All of these things. Next slide, please. So the Trudeau government operates in secret. Um, you know, through this working group uh, to review law and policies. They've now set up a cabinet committee on reconciliation, headed up by Jim Carr, who was the Minister of Inter International Trade, I think. He was also the Minister of Natural Resources, who said that, you know, to get the pipeline built, they'll have to have the rule of law and maybe bring in the army. So he's the chair of this committee on reconciliation. <laughs> And uh, they've taken over the work that Jody Wilson Raybould and them were doing. She's on the committee, but so is uh, Bennett and Phil Pot and all these other ministers. Next slide, please. I gotta kind of move this along. You got time? When? Um, um, about like a half hour. <clears throat> there's a break. There's a, there's a longer break. Okay. Not for work after this. <laughs> no. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll answer all your questions. <laughs> Uh, so the ten principles Hayden talked about, basically they reinforce the doctrine of discovery. Um, they're based on that Constitution Act 1867. Uh, they water down the UN uh, Declaration, for example, principle six in these ten principles on indigenous relations says uh, the government will aim to get free prior informed consent. But if you read the Declaration, it says states shall obtain the free prior informed consent from indigenous peoples, not aim to. So they're rewriting and watering down the, uh, the UN Declaration and these 10 principles at the same time. 
as Hayden said in his presentation, these are basically guidelines for developing policy and legislation that they're using. And AFN was silent on this. They didn't do any critical uh, breakdown on this. The only ones I saw that did any uh, critical analysis of this was that Nathan Obed, the Inuit, National Inuit leader. I think he's got a lot of integrity, that guy. He, he challenged these 10 principles, too, because Jody wilson Rabo issued them unilaterally a month after they signed that agreement with AFN on shared priorities. And so AFN didn't even know about these 10 principles. And then in August, two months after they signed that agreement with AFN on shared priorities, they announced they were dissolving Indian affairs. It's and interesting great. that she developed a tool kit with her husband and her sister. To I'm going to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so again, they're dissolving the Department of Indian Affairs and uh, creating two new federal departments. And in order to cover his butt, the Prime Minister said, well, that's what the Royal Commission of Aboriginal Peoples recommended. So they're cherry picking what's in the Royal Commission report. You know, when it first came out, we said there should be a joint review of those recommendations between AFN and, because I worked for Open Mentory when he was National Chief when that came out. And that's what we were saying. There should be a joint review of that uh, RCAP report because there's 440 recommendations in five volumes. We should figure out which ones are priorities and focus on the other ones. But they shelved it, and then he brings it out to say, well, I'm doing this. But the very first recommendation in the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples Report, you can look it up, that's your homework, <laughs> is uh, it's telling the governments and courts to stop relying on the doctrine of discovery and terra nullia as racist colonial doctrines or concepts you know, in their defense against our rights. And that's what I believe, that even the Supreme Court's in a conflict of interest because it bases its decisions on the doctrine of discovery. And that's why I said Section 35 was supposed to be a political agreement, but they ran out the clock on us and then their courts took over and started defining our rights for us. And that's why we're in the situation we're in now. Uh, I think we need to bust open the Constitution again. But anyways, that takes, that'll take a big moment. Um, then again, these establishment of rights tables, this is the basis that they're using to basically be feedback into how they created this new federal legislation and what it is, this national legislation, the framework legislation. Uh, next slide. So getting to this um, recognition legislation. Next slide. You know, on Valentine's Day, um, the Prime Minister announced that he was going to come up with this um, recognition and implementation of Indigenous rights framework. Um, next slide, please. I noticed Hayden used that same picture. Um, so as I said, it was announced on Valentine's Day. They, uh, they want to introduce it, as far as I knew, before uh, Christmas break. We thought that they were looking at doing it at the same time that AFN's having a special assembly, December 4th and 6th of Ottawa, because it would seem to coincide before Parliament breaks for Christmas. Um, and they wanted to become law before the next federal election. Uh, Minister Bennett has said the Prime Minister wants that. Which means they'd have to get it passed by June because, you know, I don't think there's probably even going to be any kind of fall sitting because uh, they'll have to drop the writ in September. So right after the summer, I think going into the federal election. So if they did any laws they don't pass in Parliament by June, they're going to die until after the next election, including this one. <clears throat> and she's, uh, the minister has stated that it's going to be enabling opt-in legislation and that the standing committee could consider amendments to the bill in the new year. And as I just said, in the Mikasu decision, it says they don't have to consult us on legislation. We react to it after take it to court for constitutional or whatever, but it costs money. And um, so once they start this legislative process to create this law, which is the biggest thing I've seen in my lifetime, it's like when the original First Indian Act was put into law in 1876 and we had no say in it. This is equivalent to that. It's huge. It's going to last for generations if it goes through. And um, there's been silence on it. You know, AFN's been pretty much silent on it. They're only starting to make notice about it now. Um, but in the spring, they had a, a meeting, an AFN Special Assembly on legislation, March 1st and 2nd. And 
even the other legislation, there was no real critical analysis of it. Next, next slide, please. So, in September um, 10th, they released an overview document, and the federal government. And in there, they said the structure of the legislation is going to include the definition section, preamble and purpose, obligations binding on the Crown, implementation of the framework. Uh, they want institutions, either existing or new ones. They'll have an amendment in there to say that the Interpretation Act will apply to all legislation, basically meaning it's without prejudice to this act. And because uh, this is their crowning act for dealing with this. And then they want to have a new policy on recognition and implementation of rights to go along with the law. So the framework is going to be this national law and a, a bunch of policies to replace the self government policy and the comprehensive claims policy. Um, but then it seems that this other legislation, the First Nations Land Management Act and all that, will fit into this framework legislation. And they also, uh, well, please we'll go to the next slide. So according to that overview document, <laughs> this framework, if passed, will be the basis for all relations between the federal government and indigenous peoples. So First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, including pre-1975 treaties. So on the one hand, in their 10 principles, they say that they're doing a distinctions-based approach between First Nations, the Métis, and the Inuit. But on the other hand, they want to pass a national law to deal with all relations in a one-window concept. That's what this framework law will be. <coughs> and it's going to include the, and <clears throat> as I said, they say pre-75 because the James Bay Agreement uh, was a modern treaty, the first one in 1975. But in my view, that should really say 1983 because that's when they amended the Constitution to include the James Bay Agreement and other treaties after that. Uh, in its treaties in section 35. So it's a little misleading that they use that term. But it's because they made the James Bay Agreement retroactive, made that provision apply to the James Bay Agreement retroactively, you know, after it passed. So when that constitution was amended, it included that agreement. So the problem with them doing definitions, and we've already seen this with the inherent right to self-government in 1995, they defined that in a policy which is an anything but inherent right policy. Because it says what's on the table and what's not on the table for negotiations, but they're going to define treaty rights and everything else in those definitions. And then federal and provincial powers and jurisdiction will continue to dominate because that first constitution remains in place. And um, the provincial government has a veto over any agreements affecting their jurisdiction. You've got that now in the self-government policy, which will be elevated into legislation. So they're saying to us, free prior informed consent doesn't contain a veto, but the provinces have a veto in anything touching their jurisdiction. So, and all of this is being based on reserve. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So they want to establish an advisory committee or institution to decide what indigenous nations are collectives will be federally recognized. And you'd have the authority of a government possessing the legal capacity of a natural person meaning a federal corporation. Now they tried to use this language in the First Nations Governance Act under Kretschek in 2000, 2000, 2004, I guess. Um, but that's what it means when they start using that language about the legal capacity of a natural person. And they're also basically saying they won't recognize you have any rights until after you have an agreement. Remember what they were saying in the Constitution, the Constitutional Talks. And, um, that is going to be, well, as it says, subject to agreements with the federal and provincial governments. And again, where the provincial jurisdiction is affected, um, they have a veto or a say. Um, that's why even on child welfare, you can't have a child welfare agency without provincial agreement. Then that's, yeah. that's happening right now in Ontario. Yeah, right across the country. It's happening. And, um, and then the federal government legislation will have a list of powers for indigenous governments that they federally recognize and those will be amended by the federal government. So they're controlling the pen in all this. Next slide, please. And as I pointed out, he's referred to indigenous governments as a lower order of government or a lower level of government as a fourth level. And it would be a new order of government, that's what they're saying. And again, they want to get rid of the tax exemption to get indigenous governments developing own source of revenue. Now, Hayden pointed out in his presentation 
that they suspended the only source revenue policy put it in advance for three years. But the only reason why they've done that is because they're doing research to come up with baseline information on new funding formula for bands who signed or groups who signed sub government agreements and modern treaties to figure out what a fair funding formula will be. And then that's what they're going to try and get the Indian Act bands to move into after that. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So the new law will use existing or federally created national institutions uh, to give an advisory role and also advice on oversight of implementation, dispute resolution. Again, they want this law to have a dispute resolution built into it. And, um, well, again, this is just to the time frame before Christmas, before the election. Next slide, please. So these are the slides I added in. This was part of my platform when I ran for national chief. I said, uh, these are the kind of things that we need to put up as a priority, is to protect uh, Mother Earth, lands, waters, and climate. And that's consistent with our original instructions. And that's what we need to work on from our communities and nations. And I talk about, you know, in the United Nations, even these, uh, these uh, international conventions on climate change and biodiversity are all showing that we're having an effect on the planet and climate change. And that, um, you know, we need to have uh, shared decision making on the resource management along jurisdictional lines of authority that are recognized to apply that standard of free prime from consent, not just a duty to consult. And it should, should include, um, you know, our traditional knowledge in any environmental reviews and oversight. That's what I think. Um, the self-determination plan should include. Next slide, please. And it should be consistent with, uh, you know, international standards and principles. Because like I said, they're domesticating and watering it down. Instead of free prior informed consent, they're forcing us into the duty to consult where it's pretty much one-sided in their favor and not ours. <clears throat> um, and then I just refer to these early pre-confederation treaties as the basis of where our relationship should be based on the treaties I referred to um, in the Maritimes, the Treaty of Gamalagi, the Niagara Treaty, the Robinson Treaties, the number of treaties. But they're not doing that. They're basing it on the Indian Act and now this new framework legislation. Because they're saying the treaties are going to be subject to this new law, too. Sorry, trigger happy. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, this just points out that uh, we're on 0.2% of the land and we need to have provinces involved to get additional lands. And um, so far, Trudeau hasn't talked about or included the provinces in any of this. Next slide, please. So this is just to say that we need to develop our own self-determination plans for community development nation based on restoration of stolen lands. That's Article 26. Our um, restitution, which is Article 28 of the UN Declaration. If we're not getting our lands, we should get compensation and be able to work with that. <clears throat> that should be the basis of our plans. Next slide, please. So basically, these are just the checklists that I have of things that you know each community and nation has to have in place. Um, whether you're negotiating or going to court, you have to show evidence of your rights. You have to respond to challenges from crown governments or industry on their current plan project or activities in their traditional lands. Even if you go out and blockade, you're going to wind up in court and have, a, to have evidence to defend yourself. Many of our people are criminalized trying to protect our lands. Um, you know, most of the activities, Zipper Wash, Oka, you name it, most of those conflicts started of people going out to defend the lands and getting criminalized in the process. So you need to know your history, language, culture, and indigenous law, your right to be there. Uh, next slide, please. And then you have to collect that information or evidence. And here I, I lay it out. You need contemporary land and resource management information, you know, GIS, computer mapping, resource models and inventories, figure out what the obstacles from legislation and regulations uh, and federal provincial governance frameworks are, list the third parties operating without consent on your territory, and identify lands that have been taken from you without your consent versus less encumbered lands. So what less encumbered means, for example, is obviously the city of Collingwood is pretty much alienated, but there might be other lands, you know, along the 
the waters or in the interior in your territories where there aren't a lot of third parties there. And there might be important sacred sites or other things there, so you want to identify those to protect right away. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And then evaluation. You know, we don't do this. So this is what Art Manuel was working on up until he passed. And that was to, you know, assess accounting practices, the impact of um, Aboriginal title and treaty rights, because Art always pointed out that Aboriginal title and treaty rights are macroeconomic issues. That we're subsidizing the Canadian economy because the cost of goods and services don't include compensation to us or our people in the lands, territories, and resources they've taken from us. And he used that argument in the software lumber dispute. And the trade panel and the World Trade Organization recognized that as a right following the Delgaman decision, which recognized Aboriginal title exists in Canada. So he used that argument successfully. But we don't do that enough ourselves to assess what's the worth of our territories that, that they're taking out. And not just economically, but e ecologically. And um, so, you know, even with the corporations, you can go after the corporations that are operating on the territory and put pressure on them, you know, to say that they're getting subsidies or unfair competition. So this is something we need to look at more for the sustainable development plans and, and our uh, FPIC approaches. Next slide. I'm almost done. <laughs> so you need ne negotiation, litigation support. You know, chief and councils or leaders or whoever it is that's in charge for the community or nation to handle these things, you need to know constitutional and international policy and law. And um, so you need advice. You need this information database, historical and, and resource management to draw from during negotiations. And cultural information, as Bernie pointed out, to go along with the historical information, how we how we manage lands and how we value the management of lands from traditional uh, traditional point of view. And then you need an interdisciplinary team of advisors, either have them in-house, you know, your own people, if they have the skills, or you're gonna have to hire outside people to help you. Uh, in the short term. And you need to identify sources of sustained funding uh, to prepare for litigation or international strategies as options because it costs money. And it's not cheap. But, you know, it's either staying under the status quo and under the thumb of the province and the feds or, or pushing open the system to make your own way out of it in terms of your own plan. Next slide, please. So this is a pitch for Terry Tobias' book. He's got a book called Living Proof. Uh, if you're going to do community mapping, um, I'd say you have to look at this book. It's a requirement. I work with Terry on a number of projects across the country. And this is basically the how-to um, to do cultural mapping in your community with your people and to aggregate that at the nation level. So the methods are in here on how to do interviews, how to mark it down onto um, maps and get it put into a digital computer format to be able to use to back up your negotiation strategies. <laughs> Next slide, please. So you can just hit the buttons to it all up. So. so these are, it's all about information management. And these are all different sources of information. And it's all to lead to a decision. Get another one. Again. And then it's all how do you interpret this information? Let's get it once more. So these are all the, these are all the uh, the sources of information. So when we're talking about free prior, that's why I like what Chris said: free prior information um, consent. I know you know it wasn't exactly what he meant, but I think he's right. Information you can't have uh, in consent without being informed. And you need information. And our communities are not good at developing and collecting the information we need to take on the government and industry. That's why we get beat in a lot of fights. But the ones who are successful and who wind up in court and win, or who wind up in the negotiating table and win, are the ones that have figured this out and have people that can help them do it. So archives and libraries, everybody should have one. Um, next slide. So that's my conclusions. Um, Canada is developing a Canadian definition, uh, the trade agreement, even the new one, like NAFTA is going to continue to impact on our rights because it gives access 
And it's also based on the federal interpretations of Section 35, which are very narrow. Trudeau hasn't mentioned land, territories, and resources. And in Canada, as I said, the duty to consult and strength of claim are the tests being used instead of free prior farm consent. And that puts the burden on us, and it's an unfair burden that the courts have placed on us without us being funded to fight back. Because most of our money's tied um, to federal funding, and they won't let us sue the government with it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. next, next uh, slide. So, this is my last one. This is that whole nation to nation process is false reconciliation. Our people have been deliberately misled and bypassed for three years in the secret top down approach by Trudeau, who's using AFN and selected chiefs. I'm sure, not the ones here. <laughs> I have to say selected. <laughs> and uh, in leaders and chiefs of operations. So there's not much time to stop this. Although uh, yesterday I did see McLean's magazine put out an article which surprised me. I don't know where he's getting his information. He's saying it looks like the recognition framework is stalled. But I'm hearing from other sources that they want to go through with it. And I think they do because this is the main centerpiece of Trudeau's platform is his new relationship with Indigenous peoples. And if he doesn't get this put into uh, Parliament soon, it won't pass before the next election. And I think he wants to run on this and get enough leaders to come out and support him to say that they support it as well. So that's my conclusion as to why we should reject it and demand the government start over with our people from the ground up and start to talk down. So that's it. Thank you.